as we come back from that emotional space and this beautiful film, as you can see, the panelists have now turned on their camera. And I first just want to thank you all again for stepping into that brave space to share your experiences and your children. The love for your children uh, is palpable through these experiences. I'm gonna take a couple minutes um, to introduce this amazing group of people you have in front of you. First, the collaborative filmmaking team who is the reason for this project. I'd like to welcome Sarah Bauman, PhD, MPH, Assistant Professor at the Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences at University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health, and Jessica Burke, PhD, MHS, Vice Dean and Professor, Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences, University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health. They are the researchers and the creators and um, made this film happen with our amazing family. So thank you. Um, I will share that we're gonna use this next uh, 50 minutes to really focus on the space of our bereaved families and our bereaved parents that we have on the panels. We also imagine that you probably have a lot of questions about the process and the research, and those are really important too. So I do invite you to please freely put those questions in the chat. We're hoping to do an additional video later to answer some of those really important questions, um, but that will not be the focus of this particular session. Um, so to Sarah and Jesse, thank you so much. Um, what a beautiful gift you have given the world, and we are so lucky to have gotten to be here for this premiere of the video. And I next want to introduce um, our parent panelists um, who you got to meet um, in different ways on these videos. And as a reminder, you know, these videos, the footage is theirs. The footage of these films is unedited from what these families created. And as you can see, they're all very different. And I think just like everybody's grief experience is different, the pieces of their journeys, right? You could imagine these are just pieces of their grief journey that they shared with us are very different, but all of the emotions and experiences and thoughts and what was gained and lost would be expected in such a significant loss. I'd like to welcome Cassie Grassmeyer, Jack's mom, Allison Weber, Timothy's mom, Maureen Pence, Isaiah's mom, Megan Leinbach, Ryder's mom, and Tara Hackwalder, Elizabeth's mom. I wish we were all in the same room because I just, um, I hope you know how much it means to me and all of us here today that you, you took on this experience. I don't know, but I can imagine that it was not easy. Um, for any of you and the fact that you were willing to do this and now share it with such a wide audience, we greatly appreciate it. So um, thank you for that. Uh, we're gonna spend again the next 50 minutes just really having conversations. So again, I would like to invite um, those that are listening to this to please ask your questions, share your thoughts. We will pull those into conversation. Um, just for you to know, the panelists may um, turn off their camera if they need a moment away from screen. I invite the audience to do that too. I recognize that there are a lot of emotions in this space. Sometimes we just need to pause. Please do that. Um, this space is um, meant to be a space where we can be together and each of us will need different things. Cassie, I'm hoping it's okay if I start with you. Um, you talked about a lot of things and um, one of those things is just thinking about time and wanting more time. Are there ways that you sort of view time now, maybe um, differently or the same and sort of using that? Well, I think um, yesterday was actually the three-year anniversary of Jack's death. So yeah. all of this timing um, is pretty relevant. And um, my husband and I will say all that, like, it doesn't feel like it's been three years ago. Um, we can still remember every little part of the night that he passed. Mm -hmm. um, last night, we spent the evening listening to music um, and just trying to 
be in that space where Jack was and try to sit with it um, because time just goes so fast all the time. Um, you know, to think back over his eight years uh, as well, I it, it's a blur. I can't believe it's over. Um, and I think that's probably the hardest part is thinking about it being over. So I try to stay busy all of the time to make time go faster, I think. Um, I don't know what my end goal is there, except to be with him someday. But um, yeah, I'm just, I feel like we keep saying that we need to slow down, um, but it's really hard to do. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And, you know, you talked about with Jack living life to the fullest and sort of living every moment does that carry into the space of grief and bereavement I I want it to um I think it's something that I struggle with and I I think it's hard to just be in the moment uh especially without him um you know I try to be in the moment with my family um but again, I'm, I'm always in a hurry. I'm always rushed. I'm always on to the next thing. Um, and I think I do that to hide and, and to run from my grief, which I talked about. Um, I'm not a runner. <laughs> I don't run. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I run in my head, my head runs, um, but, but not me. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's something that I need to work on is just being in the moment. Easier said than done though, right? Because it's yeah. it's hard to stop and it's hard to sit in this space of grief mm -hmm. and it's hard to keep running too, right? That yeah. that can catch up yeah. with you. Right. Allison, I, oh, sorry. Allison, no, I'm wondering I... if you have a similar experience in terms of how you sit or don't sit in that grief experience. Well, I, I used to be a runner, um, not anymore. Um, it doesn't work. You can run from things, but you can't run from your head. Your head is completely attached, your emotions. So it, it doesn't work that way either. So, and I, I've tried, it doesn't work. Um, and it, it just continues because um, I'm still doing everything again with that I did with Timothy, um, but just with Christopher now. So it's still, living fresh so everything that timothy experienced christopher is experiencing now so um and it is you I, I sometimes you just forget to be the parent and you gotta be nurse gotta be materials manager a social worker the therapist and even trying to be present today i'm running up and down the stairs coordinating oxygen tank deliveries and a visiting nurse with a wound care right now. And it's just hard just to be mom. I, I and I'm, I'm failing still. And, and you would think that after the first time I would get the lessons right, stop that nonsense and sit with a book or sit with music and just enjoy that time. And um, that's why it just, it's so important to just keep trying and remembering that and um, and stop running because there's just nowhere to go. Yeah, I think in some ways it's not always possible, right, to sit and stop, especially when you might have other children to care for. You might be working in or out of the home. There are things in life that don't stop and that you have to attend to. And finding that time can be really hard. You know, as a social worker, one of the things that we talk a lot about is, is this sort of term of self-care, which I, I struggle with, right? I think it has negative connotations these days, but one of the things that I try to share with families is that self-care can mean five minutes out of your day to stop, to pause, to go outside, to, to be in whatever that place is. And Maureen, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that or or what that sort of stop and pause for you has looked like after Isaiah's death.
I would have to say that I'm kind of along the lines with everyone else. You just keep running. The time to pause isn't there. Um, chasing other children, other jobs, family, just trying to keep moving. You know, Megan's video helped me to realize exactly what I wasn't expressing. It was so beautiful, helping me to see this is what I should be saying. This is how I, I should be screaming for help. And I'm not, I just keep running and moving and just trying to get it all done. Um, yes, running from it. Yes, running to it. Just running. Wrong either, right? There's no roadmap for grief, especially when you have lost a young child as you have. And there's often nobody leading you on this part of your journey, right? There's a question um, from Claire. And Megan, I'm wondering if you might start with this question. How does it feel for you in this moment after having gone through the process of filmmaking and sharing this piece of art now with others? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it's it's interesting to watch, I think, um, because us ladies have been meeting for now, or now I mean, at least 18 months. Um, so I look at the person who who did that video and I'm like, hmm, like I'm not her anymore or like I'm further in my journey now. And so I appreciate the the filmmaking experience to capture um, who I was and what I was thinking at that time. Um, and not saying I don't feel those ways still, um, but it was definitely a tool to process my grief. I didn't think that way, um, I guess the whole time during this, I thought this was just something I had to do and check it off my list, right? Cause like Cassie had said, we're always finding something else to do and what do we do next and what else can we fill our time with? But um, yeah, I think now going through the process and sharing it with others, I'm really proud of, of what I was able to accomplish um, because that day I I was having one of the worst days I had had in a very long time. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to film it, right? Like, how can I go wrong with this? Like, I'll just film it. So so I'm appreciative of of the film and and being able to like just just capture that that feeling and share it with others. And like I said, if it resonates, it resonates. If not, you know, but but that's how I was feeling. And yeah, I, I'm glad I was able to capture it. I am too. And I, I think a piece of what you said a couple of times of feeling like there is no room for your grief, I think is something so many bereaved parents feel, right? Like there is not space for this. People are uncomfortable in this space and don't know even how to just be present, let alone let what to say. And so I, I think your experience is not, it is isolating, but it is not isolated. Tara, I'm wondering if you might answer the same question from Claire again about the process of filmmaking and how it now feels to share this with others. Sure. Um, I think that, I think it is a great question. Um, and I think that Dana, that you had said something that I think is really important for people to understand. Um, we live in a culture that's incredibly uncomfortable with grief. And we don't live in a society in the United States where people are even comfortable with the concept of death. Um, and so I have found, you know, like Megan had mentioned um, in her piece of the documentary that there's no room for this. And that's very true. Um, one of the unfortunate things is, is that you find out very quickly who your people are and who your people were not. Um, and it can be very isolating. Um, I come from a, a very large family. I have a wonderfully supportive husband. I have a son who is the reason that I have continued to get out of bed every day. And um, even despite all of that, it can feel very lonely. And so when I was asked to participate in this, um, I had actually just very freshly lost Elizabeth. Um, she passed in August of 2021. And I remember 
like filming different segments. And I had been writing to her really since the day after she died in my arms when I wrote her obituary. Um, and I thought, I'm not sure if this is what they want, but I thought if even in my writing and the things I share on social media, if one person reads it and it makes them feel less alone, then it was worth that process to me. And so I had texted Cassie when this started rolling today. And I said, this seems so surreal. We've, it's something we've worked so hard on and it's so deeply personal. Um, but it feels at the same time really good to know that these stories are out there and that, you know, maybe it helps one person. That would be amazing. But even if it just makes somebody understand that has never even been through this, how uncomfortable it can be to talk about this and that when your friends lose someone, especially a child, they need you more than they've ever needed you, even if you were uncomfortable. Um, because I ensure you that there is nothing more uncomfortable than this. And so I'm very proud and honored to be among these ladies and sharing this. I think you're going to be helping more than one person. And, you know, I was not lucky enough to get to know and meet Elizabeth, but man, did you get to know her in this video too. And so I think of all of the people that will get to have a glimpse of who, who she was, who she is and how much she was loved. And I think that is such an important piece of all of this too. I um, am wondering, you know, when you all first heard of this project, were there others around you, immediate or extended family or friends that you talked about possibly doing this project? Did they have reactions that um, maybe even had hesitation about you joining this project or was there support? Tell me about that process. Tara, do you want to start with this one? Sure. Um, my husband um, and my son were not in the documentary piece that I filmed, but they have known about it and have been very supportive um, of the entire process. Um, you know, one of the things that I think has helped us is that we've all, since the very beginning, understood that we need to give ourselves grace to handle this in whatever way we see fit. Um, I've been very vocal about our experience with losing Elizabeth um, from the beginning. Um, but I've always been very vocal. Anyone who's ever known me long-term knows that that's just the way that I am. Um, my husband's much more of a private person, but he was still very um, supportive of this. Um, he has only seen bits and pieces of it. Um, and what I have talked to him about, he hasn't actually seen the whole thing, but um, I just think it's a time, a timing thing for that. I think that he will watch it. And I think that, you know, and my son will watch it. Um, we just, it was two years and three months on um, Monday since we've lost Elizabeth. And that day we lost a very dear friend of ours. And in the last month we've lost another um, one to cancer and one to ALS. And I just think, um, you know, it's a lot and we're always missing her. Um, and so He's been very supportive and so is my family. And I'm grateful for that, so. Yeah, I think you highlighted again, right? Like this is part of your grief experience and maybe an unexpected piece, right? I'm, I'm sure you didn't expect to be making a film, but what is helpful for everybody and that changes over time is, is very different too. Um, there's a, a couple questions in the chat. One thing I just wanted to, to highlight is Jill had shared, you know, I, Megan had mentioned, I don't think anything I'm doing is, is correct. I just, and Jill feels very connected to that candor and, and real, right? And I think that's something we think about all of the time, right? Like, have we failed something? Am I doing something right? And I think when you think about grief, right, as an experience, especially when you've lost a child, which is so not natural and not normal, right? There is no correct, but I think we naturally instinctively 
look for what's right, whatever that means. And I, I don't think it means anything in, in this type of scenario. Um, Megan, does that resonate with you of sort of that search, but not feeling like nothing feels right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have a little bit of imposter syndrome through my entire, like every avenue of my life. And so I think someone else is always doing it correctly, doing the whole momming thing correctly, doing the whole wife thing correctly, doing the whole social work thing correctly. Right. Like, and so when I even think of my grief, I'm like, oh, well, so-and-so started a foundation or this person's doing this. Like maybe I should be doing more with my grief or, um, and, and then there's days where I'm just like, can I just lay in this bed? Like, I don't want to do anything with it. So it's just this idea that I just, I, I'm just not doing it correctly. And maybe somebody else would do it better than me. So, and I thought that when my, that was, when my son was alive, right. I mean, him having special needs, like someone has to be better at this than me. Right. Like I, I, who am I to be, you know, drawing up meds and making orders and, you know, there's doctors who go to school forever to do these things. And here I was just handed a baby and was said, here, go do this. Right. Um, so yeah, just constant second guessing yourself. And so it just doesn't feel, none of it feels right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, there's another question in the chat from, from Grace. And um, she asked on, on your better days, do you ever feel guilty for feeling less intense grief um, or does that ever act as a barrier to maybe moving forward with things that you want to do or sort of just even getting through the day to day? Maureen, I'm wondering if you would be able to share about that. You know, I think that I ran so hard from it for so long that this movie helped to bring it to where it needed to be so that I could actually experience instead of bury everything I was feeling um, about the loss of Isaiah and our family moving on without him because he's here, but he's not here. Um, and there is tremendous guilt when, you know, when we first lost him, as Cassie said, it was like, it was too soon. It wasn't soon enough. You just, you can't pick the right time to lose a child. And you don't know how you're going to respond when it happens. And I just kept going, like got through the funeral, got through this, did the big carnival thing, just kept moving and not really taking that time to experience what I needed to so that I could move on as a mom to my other children and as a person. It's also really hard when you still have to take care of a lot of people to like process what you need yourself right like I imagine you don't know for a long time what you actually need Allison did you experience that um in terms of you know when Timothy died how did you figure out what you needed and what felt helpful to you well when he uh, first died it was very unexpected um I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't ready for it. Um, I tried to revive him myself. It was not a very good scene. It wasn't a peaceful scene. It was not the way I wanted him to go. Um, lights and sirens to the hospital, EMS personnel not listening to me, um, doctors on the phone, and I'm trying to tell them, no, they don't have they're not intubating him it's not in the, the air his airway was not secure and um he and i blamed myself in the beginning that maybe if i had gotten him to the hospital sooner he would have been in the right place we would have prevented this and um and i and i i had like vital signs every hour that i wrote down i'm like what did i miss and for six years, I looked at that list and to see what I was missing, because I blamed myself for his his passing. Um, but I also knew, and I come into um, the realization that I had to be there. I had to do it because if I wasn't there, and it had happened, I would have blamed myself for not being there. 
and missing it. So as hard as it was witnessing the chest compressions and everything that was going on in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, I knew for my own good, it, it had to go that way. I still wish it was nicer, um, but I just think my personality, I, we would have fought to the bitter end anyway. And then when we got to the, the ED and they've been working on him for quite some time, I asked them, um, how long has he been down? And they told me, and I asked, I heard that my husband was able, was called and was in the waiting room and to, to come. And I said, "Hon," I said, it's over. And, uh, because I did not want him, Timothy brought back less than what he was. It was hard enough being a paralyzed child in a body and then have no mind and his personality to be gone. Uh, and so I, with, we discussed it briefly and we just said, stop the code and everyone stepped back and that's what it was. Um, so yeah, in the beginning, I, I, I did blame myself. I got over that. Um, and it, you, in the beginning too, when you start enjoying things, it's a little bit of a pang. Um, but that, it, it, for me, it was so long ago. I, I don't, I no longer experience any of that. Yeah. I think, you know, you're sharing almost that you had to go through a full process in thinking about those moments and all you did for your child and family really. But I, you know, I think guilt and blame is one thing as a provider and supporting families that I really struggle with because you can reassure and you can know, right, that you did all the things and that you did absolutely everything you can, but words don't take that feeling of guilt away. And I think there is a true thing of parental guilt, right? And when you become a parent, it's just sort of in you in some way, Um it's beautiful to hear about how you process that, but that is also really not an easy process. And I'm not sure that every parent gets to a point of like realizing, okay, like this wasn't my fault or I did all the right things. I think it's it's really a hard thing to move through. I'm wondering, um, Cassie, there's a question. The question is, did making the film you know, give you any new perspectives on your own grief journey, or or maybe even I'm wondering, did anything surprise you as you were making this film? Yeah, um, certainly. But I wanted to just say to Allison, I think um, what you just talked about with Timothy and the fear for not being there, that was one of my biggest fears um, the entire time that I was going to miss something or miss the moment that he passed and um luckily that didn't happen um to us so I I get that um and I think too um when I started to make this film it was kind of similar to everybody else that sat in the corner for a little bit and I was like, I need to get this done because it needs to go to the next person. We need to pass the equipment on. And there was no pressure from anyone except for myself. So I decided one day that I was just gonna, I was just gonna do it. And um, I worked really hard on it. Um, I think for like three days total. And when I was finished and happy with the end result, the next day I, I wasn't expecting to feel the way that I did, but I was like overcome with grief. I, it was probably one of the only days where I felt like I cannot get up out of bed um, because every day I've just had to keep going, keep going, keep going. And I don't have any other children. Um, I do have a husband and three crazy dogs and we live with my parents. So they keep me going, but I, I, it, it was overwhelming the feeling after it and in, in a good way. Um, I think it really helped me process just a little bit more and say the things, um, some of the things that I said in the video, I wouldn't say, because if you know me, you know, I'm always, uh, always smiling, always putting on a happy face and that's how I get through the day. Um, but sometimes 
people are like, how do you, how do you do that? Um, how do you keep putting on that happy face? And I honestly, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how I do it, um, but I just keep doing it. And I think in that moment um, with the finished product, I was proud of what I could say um, and what I could do. Um, and then when we got together again and watched everybody's film, Megan, I'm going to say it again, like yours was real, yours was raw, and I can't be like that with everyone. Um, but I know I could be like that with you ladies because you truly understand. Um, so, yeah. And I think that's important to know, right? Like who, who can you share the full range of true emotions with? Because it's not everybody. I'm wondering, Cassie, um, are there things that you wish others would know or things that were or would have been helpful in your grief for others to support you with or do or offer? I mean, I do have um, a core group of people that are always there for me. Um, they may not live close, but I know that they're there. Um, my family is always there. My husband is amazing. Um, I couldn't do life at all without him and my amazing parents. But uh, some people have um, disappeared a little bit. Um, it might be too hard for them. Um, I'm not really sure why, uh, because, you know, when you, when you have a grief like this, it doesn't end. Um, so I think it's really hard to, um, not think about Jack or not talk about him. So I often bring him up in everything that I do, um, at work, uh, he comes up a lot with my students as I'm teaching them about um, students with special needs. I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly thinking of him and talking about him and trying to bring him into my life. I'm not sure if that makes people uncomfortable or not, um, but that's who I am. I do tend to isolate at home. Um, we like to stay home and just be in the house. Um, that's where Jack died and that's where we feel safe and like to be. But at the same time, um, uh, you know, it would be nice to know that, um, you know, people that were in our life previously would, would still come around a little bit more. Um, but I do feel very supported, um, especially through Facebook. Um, you know, social media has been a gift for me it's been an outlet for me to be able to talk about his whole entire journey um, and still sharing memories that pop up on Facebook really helped me. Um, and then seeing what everybody has to say, um, just knowing that people are also thinking about him, I think uh, helps every day. Yeah. So many grieving parents have shared how important it is to hear other people say their child's name or share a story or an experience that they have. And I think people are afraid to do that. They're afraid to maybe bring up emotion, but the reality is you're experiencing emotion every single day of your lives. And I think to know your child is important and remembered as a really important part of this experience that sometimes is missing. Um, Sarah shared something in a chat, uh, in our chat about her experience, having lost two siblings and, just sharing how how much in life changing after that experience um, that really grief has robbed her of other experiences, right? And so how you celebrate holidays or birthdays or big life moments um, and also recognizing that there's no sort of proper way to, to heal, to cope, um, and what works for everybody is, is better. And she shared, you know, take your time to heal in whatever way it makes you feel better. Um, Allison, I'm wondering if you can speak to how either life events or um, just experience in life feels different and sort of how, how you navigate those moments. I hear Cassie say, like, we actually prefer to be home. This is our safe spot. And just wondering what um, your experiences are with that. 
Well, I think shortly after the death of Timothy, we would make a birthday cake on his birthday, remember his birthday. Um, we actually was, uh, I have a set, well, they, they moved away, but we had a set of twins that lived next door and they shared a birthday. And I know they were, the, the girl especially was very um, upset when Timothy had passed. So for years, while they were still young, I would put little gifts into their mailbox on their birthday in honor of Timothy. So it was, so I, I do, so when I find someone who has the same birthday as Timothy, I like to latch onto that and make them special. Um, and it kind of helps to keep him alive by doing that. Thank you. Um, Michelle asked in one of the chats, is there, there anything you wish you could have included your films and maybe would add now, now that some time has passed? Megan, I heard from you, you know, where you were in your grieving process was very different when you created this film to now. Is there anything you would add or change now? So I, I think <clears throat> when we first debuted our films to each other, which <clears throat> was what last spring um we all got to have like a, a a rundown for them I remember watching everybody's videos and being like oh my gosh I totally messed this up like I did not do this the same way everybody else did and I remember like like the videos that everyone had with their children and and I was like you know what like maybe I didn't represent Ryder enough um you know I did have pictures of him in the background it's kind of like our our wall of our children um, but now looking at it, I'm like, you know what, I was able to capture that moment because it was a, it was a very hard day, very, very hard day. Um, and I still had to go do all my things, right? Like I live on a small farm. I have other children. Um, you know, they have sports, they have, I have grandchildren. Like I have things I have, I have to get up. Like I, I just can't not, so at first I would have said yes. Um, but, but now, no, I, I, I love my, my film. Um, I mean, I mute it when, when we watch it, but I very much, I very much like mine. Um, so I, I do, I am appreciative though, of being able to see everybody else's cre creativity. Um, and I wanted to say quick, Cassie, like, I thank you very much. Um, and I was actually just texting a friend of mine and, and in the beginning of our films and like, this is Cassie's, this is the one I was telling you about. Like, I really, like, she says things that I haven't had the heart to be able to say out loud to other people. And it's interesting because you just said the same thing. So I appreciate it. I, I think um, that was one of the interesting things about our group too. So I got to come in on this project um, at the very beginning, well, not the very beginning, but closer to, to the beginning. Um, and I was on the advisory committee to help recruit. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of people that have dead children. Isn't that great? Just put on your resume, you know, I, 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 I can do this. I'm a good recruiter here. So um lucky enough to be a part of our group with PPCC and make these connections with all of you. And we had a lot more um, at the beginning and I have to commend those people for making the decision not to create a film because it wasn't the right time for them um, to do that. But, you know, I think us knowing each other then before and then also being able to go through this together has helped us um, build our relationships um, too. So, thank you so much, Cassie, for pointing that out. Right, there actually were other families that initially signed up for this project, and you know, it was a lot. You guys got camera equipment mailed to your homes and. Um, you know, even in just thinking about these prompts that we all saw at the beginning of the film and like, where do you even start? And um, I think it is really important to, especially as you are grieving, to really give yourself grace and know what feels helpful and know what feels right and trust that gut instinct in this. And, and maybe at some point in their future, 
they will do something like this even on their own. Um, but I, I agree with you. I, um, it, it is important to note that this would not be right for every family or in every moment of time. Maureen, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in your video, um, it was so really impactful to hear things that are helpful, right? Like faith and um, sort of how to take each step forward in that. Were there things that either people did or said that were not helpful after Isaiah's death? Sorry about that. Having a little technical difficulty. No worries. Um, you know, we had a really supportive church family. Um, supportive care at Children's was incredible. Our extended family is is amazing. Um, some people just avoided us, like everyone else kind of mentioned. Some people just kind of shied away from us um, afterwards. But for the most part, people were there. Um, some really good friends offering support through text or phone calls, showing up. Um, neighbors that we barely knew, which is hard to imagine where we live, but barely knew showing up and bringing us food and frozen pizzas because one neighbor said, I, I can't cook, but here's a frozen pizza. I don't know what else to do. It was just beautiful to see how people support you. I, I think one of the hardest things when you have a child with challenges um, and people say they're better off. And yes, we know that our son is perfect and whole. We know you know, we have the faith to know that our son is in heaven. He is perfect and we can't wait to play with him there. We know that he's probably sitting on the lap of his grandfather right now. But for someone to tell us that he's better off when we don't have him is hard. It's hard for us because we're not better off without our child. And it's hard to imagine any better place for a child to be than with his family who loved him so dearly. Tara, Tara how about for you? Were there things either uh, that people did or said that felt not helpful or things that were particularly helpful for you and your family? Um, we live in a very small community and early on in Elizabeth's journey, I would often say that small towns have the biggest hearts um, because we were exceptionally supported, um, particularly in the, those last 38 days um, when she had suddenly and very unexpectedly taken a turn. Um, one of the things I think that was most helpful, and this is going to sound so silly, um, someone brought us so much toilet paper. <laughs> I mean, people bring you all kinds of things and I, I, I have appreciated them all, um, in their own right, but there was something about knowing that I wasn't going to have to run to the store because I was out of toilet paper. Um, it was very comforting. And I would never have thought about that until someone did that for me. And now, you know, when I'm trying to think of what could I do instead of maybe taking them food, um, and I can cook, but I definitely load them up on things that they need that they won't have to go to the store for. Because um, I remember just thinking how nice it was that I wasn't going to have to go to the store and get cornered. Um, so, and along with what, you know, Maureen said, and I completely relate to what Allison has said about that guilt. Um, Elizabeth for most of all of her life required constant around the clock care. And I resigned from my job. Um, I am teaching again after all this time, but I was a teacher and I resigned and I became a full-time nurse um, and a mom. And it, it's difficult, you know, and you, I constantly, I mean, still ask myself, like, did I do the right things? Um, and it is, incredibly upsetting to me. And I know people think that it's helpful that, you know, she's better off and that she's healed now. And I know that, um, I, I have said before that to people that have asked me about that, you know, like, you know, but you're, I have people that have said things like, well, 
you know, you loved her. We know how much you loved her. And if love could have saved her and any number of things, which is, which is all very true. And I guess one way that has helped me was she did have this incredibly restorative peace when she took her last breath, unlike anything I've ever seen. And she looked like she had never suffered a day in her life. Um, and I'll never forget that. And I'm thankful for that because I'm thankful that I was here when she eventually took her first breaths and that I was holding her when she took her last and that it was so peaceful. But we had worked her whole life to give her her very best life. And she did everything that we did. And I don't think her life was any less valuable because she was sick. And um, when people say things like, you know, they're healed and they're not suffering, well, I'm quite aware of how sick she was, quite aware. Um, but I never for a moment thought that even in her sickest and worst moments, even in all the scares that we'd ever had her whole life, running into the ER and getting dirty looks because they take you back first before other people that have been waiting. Um, you know, I've never even thought in those most terrifying moments that she was better off to die. And that has been incredibly helpful. And I know people say it from a place of you know, they, they say that to try to make you feel better. Um, and I, that just has not been helpful to me. Yeah. I think when I started on this career path, I thought, well, people mean, well, they can't really say things that are harmful, but there's actually a lot that is really harmful and actually being present and saying nothing is sometimes like, I, I wish people would just know that showing up and being present in this space versus saying something, nothing they say will actually make you feel better, right? It does not take away what happened. Um, and if I could give a takeaway for other people wondering what to do, it is show up and be present and don't worry so much about the words. Um, we just have a couple minutes left and I, I'm wondering, there is a question about supporting siblings. Um, and for those of you with surviving children, I'm wondering um, if there has been anything particular um, that has been helpful to them, whether it's something you as a family have done, um, whether it's something a clinician has helped you with, what has been helpful in that space? Would anyone want to share? I can actually share because um, I saw that in, in the chat and I super appreciate that um, because that, that's been one of my focuses is making sure that that my grief is not overshadowing um, my my other child's grief. Um, I have I have stepchildren. I have I have grandchildren. But then I also have this child who um, was 18 months younger than his brother. And so he's slept in ICU beds with his brother, right? And and has I've snuck him in when he was little and he had to stay overnight because I was a single mom at one point. Um so just giving him, we talk about space, giving him that space, like not telling him how he should feel. Um and and just um yeah like making sure that he has access to supports and you know, thankfully our, um, I saw somebody put in about education too. Our school district has been amazing. Um, you know, uh, Ryder, Ryder had been in our district and, um, his siblings were in our district and his, his, he passed away October 19th. Um, and so it was the very beginning of the school year, but, you know, all the principals from every building in our district came to his memorial and, and our memorial was an hour away from, from where we live. Um, so even the superintendent came. So Heaton is my other son. He has known that he is wrapped in this support system because he spends how many hours a day at school. And I would say that that has been one of, one of the biggest sources of support for him. Um, and then I would also like, again, say, letting him talk how he wants, like express the way he wants. You know, I remember him saying right afterwards, he's like, mom, do you think my brother could split into three and be with you and be with me and be with dad? 
all at the same time, like his original family. And I was like, yeah, man, like that sounds cool. Like if, if that's, if like, yeah, that, that is perfect. And he was like, I mean, he was eight. So he was like, yeah, I, I like that. And even now, like he's 12 and he he has, you know, a little bit more understanding of what happened with his brother. And, you know, when he asks questions and he kind of gives me his perspective, I'm like, yep, yep. That's, that's what we'll go with. Like, yeah. So just validating him. Yeah. I think validating and giving the space and, and not expecting children to react the same way as us. Um, to have the same emotions as us um, and also to not have the same emotions at the same time, right? Kids have emotions, right? We have them right away and often in children, it's a very different experience. I hope, um, you know, as we come down to the last couple of minutes of this section, um, we will make sure that the panelists gets all of your messages. I hope that maybe you have gotten to take a chance to scroll and look at all of the messages of thanks for your participation in this project, for your willingness to share it with this audience. It is already so clear what an impact that this film is making. Um, people are sharing that they will never listen to Coldplay or Fleetwood Mac or Garth Brooks without thinking of your beautiful children. And so um, I hope that you all can can take that in and, and hold it near to your hearts. Um, I do want to thank each of you, Cassie and your Jack sharing his story, Allison and sharing your Timothy, Maureen sharing about your Isaiah, Megan sharing about Ryder, and Tara sharing about your Elizabeth. They are children that uh, we will never forget, and we are so grateful to know their stories. I'd also like to thank again Jesse and Sarah for initiating this amazing project, for knowing that the voices of bereaved parents need to be heard. People need to know about this grief experience and what it is like for people so that maybe someday talking about death and dying will not be such an isolating experience in this world. And I, I hope it is projects like this that start to make a change. Um, and I'd like to thank the McHale Hatton Foundation for funding this project. Um, it couldn't have been done without you. And to all of you for trusting me to guide you in this past hour. Um, it is an honor to, to know you even just virtually. So I thank you very much. Um, and I invite other people, if there are last questions, please put them in the chat and we will use these to um, lead further discussions. There's also several resources on the PPP, PPCC website for siblings. I see somebody else listed an NACG.org website. Um, please look out for future webinars and Firefly chats. And I am holding all of you in my hearts today. Thank you for being with us. <laughs>